بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد uh, Last Wednesday I had begun discussing the signs of Judgment Day We had divided them into uh, a number of categories We talked about the minor signs and the major signs And then I said the minor signs as well can be divided into two types of categories Number one, specific incidents, one-off And number two, general trends So we were doing still the specific incidents And today inshallah we'll continue with the specific incidents I had mentioned the battle of the Jamal, the battle of Safin I had mentioned the spread of uh, safety in the time of the Sahaba And now we move on to the next of the minor signs That have been predicted in the authentic hadith of the Prophet of the minor signs and this clearly shows the truth of our Prophet because no one could ever have predicted this is the rise of a race that was considered to be a backward race and this is the race of the Atraq the Turks the Atraq our Prophet prophesized that this race would become dominant and that they would conquer the Arabs. Now, who are the Atraq? The Atraq are a group of races. It's not just one race. Within the Turk, there are many races. It's like saying Arab. There are many Arab sub-races. It's one of the categories of human races. The Atraq are a group of races who originate in what is essentially Mongolia and the Caucasus Mountains, that region. You can say they are the cousins of the Mongolians. So the Mongolians are a race and the Atraq are a cousin race. They have a common ancestor between them. And that is why the Turkish language and the Mongolian language, they share many similarities. Now, contrary to popular misunderstanding, the modern Atraq, the people of Turkey, are not from that land of Turkey. They are from far more east than that. They are from a land that is what is now, we call it Turkmenistan. Turkmenistan were the Xinjiang provinces. Okay? That is the land of the Atraq. And the Atraq came from there and they eventually conquered what is now modern Turkey. And it was called Turkey because the Atraq came there. Before they came there, it wasn't called Turkey. That's not the name of that land. It was called Anadolia or other lands of that nature. Uh, the name Turkey, the country Turkey, is after the race, the Atraq, that eventually conquered that region. Originally, the Atraq were a far away from the Arabs. And the Arabs never interacted with them by and large. The Arabs hardly interacted with any race other than the Sassanids and the Byzantine Empire. For our Prophet wasallam in Medina, to predict that that far away race is going to rise up and eventually dominate. What is the Ottoman Empire other than Turkish, right? This is one of those miraculous predictions. And by the way, these ahadith were compiled centuries before the rise of the Ottoman Empire. You will find manuscripts, those who deny the authenticity of hadith, you will find manuscripts written in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century, predicting the rise of the Atraq, and the Turks rose up 500 years ago, that's it. And there are many, many ahadith, the most famous amongst them, and the, these are also in Sahih Muslim, some of them. And there's a genre of hadith. The most famous amongst them, the Prophet used alliteration. Alliteration means he said things that sound the same and they have a level of eloquence. Utrukul atraka ma tarakukum. Utrukul atraka ma tarakukum. Leave the Turks as long as they leave you. Don't fight the Turks. Leave the Turk as long as they tarakukum, they leave you alone. Because when you will fight them, you will lose. And they will win over you. And that is exactly what happened. Now, some have said this could also be a prediction of the Mongol Empire. Because the, Mongol, the Mongolian race and the Turk are really kind of one race, as we said. They go back to the same heritage and even their language. And so a thousand years ago, it would not be incorrect to call the Mongols, the Genghis Khan, it would not be incorrect to call him an, a Turk, even though in modern times there are two separate ethnicities, the Mongolian and the, and the uh, Turkic races. However, others have said the prediction of Turk here is the Muslim Turks eventually, right? So eventually, this group of people, they came, amongst them were the Seljuks. So within the Turkish race, there were many famous 
dynasties, the most famous of the earliest dynasties was the Seljuk dynasty, Al-Parsalan. Al-Parsalan was the one who came to power and he was the first of the Turkish people to basically get a base in the lands of Islam and they converted to Islam and of course his main vizier was Nizam al-Mulk, the famous Nizam al-Mulk. So that was Al-Parsalan. The Seljuk Empire is not the same as the Ottoman Empire. They are both Turkic but the two of them biologically are different. So the first Turkish empire was the Seljuk Empire. They were magnificent. They came, they conquered, and then they fizzled out. And then another group came, the Usmanlis. We call them the Ottomans, right? Those of you that are watching the Ertuğrul series, which is a mythic, uh, you know, romanticization of that. But it is, you know, the kernel of history is there. So the rise of the Usman tribe, Usmanli. Ottoman is the children of Usman. This is the second prediction. And our Prophet wasallam predicted that this empire and this group would become the dominant one. And that is exactly what happened. That when the Turks came, they eventually took over the Muslim land. And in the early part of the 16th century, 15, 15 or so, they requested from the final remnants of the Abbasid Empire to hand over the Khilafah to them. And so they then acquired the Khilafah. And from around 1500 CE up until 1927, as you know, the uh, Ottoman Empire was the caliphate of Muslim lands. And it was the only empire that claimed to be the Khalifa that were non-Arab. Before this point, the Seljuks never claimed to be Khalifa. The Seljuks were a rural dynasty. They never said they were the Khalifa. The Seljuks were in power when the Abbasids were the Khalifa. And they were a powerful dynasty, but they never said they were the Khalifa. And the Ottomans were the first non-Arab to say that they were the Khalifa of Islam. Another prediction also related to the Ottoman Empire is just as bizarre. And that is the conquest of the single greatest city in the history of the medieval world. A city that we would think of it like the New York or something of our times. And that is Constantinople. Once again, what is Constantinople? Constantinople for a thousand years was the bastion of Western civilization. And what will make us understand what Constantinople was? We hardly study history, we have no idea what Constantinople was. Constantinople for over a thousand years, it was the capital of the Roman Empire. Constantine himself, Constantinople is named after him. Constantine the Great established the capital, the city existed even before then, and for a thousand three hundred years it remained the capital of the greatest empire known to man up until that point in time, and that was the great Roman Empire. And Europe was nothing at the time. Europe was a backward land. Europe was barbarians at the time. Even Christianity has not spread in Europe when Constantinople was the center of Christendom and of the Holy Roman Empire. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted that the Muslims would one day conquer Constantinople. Again, an amazing prediction. How can a small group of persecuted people in Mecca dream, daydream of conquering Constantinople? But our Prophet ﷺ predicted that. Now, because of this, the Sahaba had it in their minds that they wanted to conquer Constantinople. And in fact, the first Sahabi to launch a campaign to try to conquer Constantinople was none other than Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. When he was barely in his early 20s, he managed to come very close to Constantinople via the Navy fleet. As you know, they landed in Cyprus and then they landed on the banks of the Bosphorus and then they attempted to conquer the city, but it was way too powerful. They, see, they laid siege, but they could not. It was simply too powerful for them. And that is why the famous companion Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, he died outside of the walls of Constantinople. The famous companion, the one whom the Prophet ﷺ, he, he, he lived at in his house when he entered Medina. Can you imagine the same companion whom the Prophet ﷺ lived at his house for six months? How Allah ﷺ blessed the Ummah. How quickly did the persecuted rise up and become almost the conquerors of the world. That same companion, older on in life, he was of that batch who uh, attacked Constantinople and he passed away a shaheed. He died outside the city and he was buried in an anonymous graveyard until it was miraculously discovered when uh, Suleiman al-Fatih uh, opened it. The fact of the matter, you want my academic opinion, this is not the actual grave of, of Abu Yubal Ansari, the one that they claim to be. It is simply, uh, anyway, that's besides the point. Uh, 
I don't sugarcoat the reality. This is just uh, something that uh, the Ottomans did to shore up uh, PR, to make people like yani, feel yani, that they have something. But in reality, nobody knows why Abu is buried. Who's going to have marked the grave? How would they have known for a thousand years? Anyway, that's besides the point. Abu Ayyub al-Ansari's grave is somewhere. All I'm saying is the grave that they say that it is, it is actually, look it up historically, it is simply uh, constructed later on in history. The point being that the Sahaba attempted to conquer Constantinople and their eyes were on the prize. Many ulama and historians have said that Tariq ibn Ziyad, actually his main intention for going to Andalus was to make his way by land because he knew that by sea would not be possible because reinforcements, etc. He wanted to conquer land by land until he goes from North Africa to Andalus all the way to Constantinople. Some have presumed this and Allah knows best. The point is the eyes were on the prize. Many people wanted to conquer Constantinople, but of course it only happened in the year. Who knows what year Constantinople was conquered? What year? 14? 1453. By? Muhammad or Muhammad al-Fatih by Sultan Muhammad al-Fatih, the Turks say, uh, al-Fatih Muhammad. Uh, and the conquest of Constantinople changed the course of human history. It marked the end of one era and the beginning of another. Literally one of, you know, if you wanted to list the 10 most famous incidents in all of human history, the conquest of Constantinople is in the top five. It's that big of a deal that the Muslims finally conquered Constantinople and this was predicted by our Prophet Sallallahu Hadith is a Sahih Muslim that uh, a Sahabi asked Abdullah ibn Amr ibn As, one of the Tabi'un asked him that which one will we conquer first? Constantinople or Rome? They had heard of Rome. Rome was there. But Rome was not to the power and the level of Constantinople. It was far number two. And so he said, bring me my book. So they opened up his book because uh, Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Aus, he would write a hadith of the Prophet and his eyes were failing. He looked it up and he wanted to refresh his memory. And he said, no, the Prophet predicted that we would conquer Constantinople before Rome. And subhanAllah, Constantinople 1453. And, and in all likelihood, the other lands that are mentioned will be done during the time of the Mahdi. And Allah Azza wa knows best. Now, there is a cryptic prediction about Constantinople that kind of sort of throws a spanner in the works. It kind of is difficult to understand. And I'll mention it to you and let's see if we can get some understanding and leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talked about the Mahdi on last Saturday, I had mentioned that some ahadith seem to mention that the Mahdi will conquer Jerusalem and also Constantinople. Okay, and that is somewhat problematic because Constantinople has already been conquered and the Mahdi wasn't there. And the explicit authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim tells us the mechanism via which Constantinople will be conquered. And that is that the Muslims will lay siege for a long time and they will fall short of supplies and the, the, the himma will be going down until finally they will say, let us do dhikr of Allah loudly and we will conquer Constantinople via dhikr. And so they will begin chanting the tasbih and takbir and tahmeed and eventually the walls of the city will begin to shake and the walls will collapse because of the dhikr of the Muslims. Now that did not happen in 1453. In 1453, it was an all-out siege. Muhammad al-Fatih, he threw in the troops, the navy, the army, you know, he threw in everything. He laid siege for a number of times. Even the Ottomans tried multiple times. And by the way, one of the reasons the Ottomans could then demand from the Abbasids hand over the Khilafah, the Abbasids had gone down weak because of the Mongol invasion. They had to flee to the Mamluk Egypt and the Ottomans after they conquered Constantinople, they then felt confident enough to say, okay, you guys, you're no longer qualified to be the Khalifa. We can be the Khalifa. So there was a ceremony in which the last of the Abbasids symbolically handed his cloak and his turban to the first of the Ottoman uh, Khalifas. That actually took place, an actual ceremony. When did it take place? 
after the conquest of Constantinople, even though the Turks go back to 1300, the Ottomans go back to 1300, but they didn't feel confident enough to say to the Khalifa, make us the Khalifa, until they had the prize, until they had the silver platter with the city on it, and that is Constantinople. And of course, as you all know, they changed the name to Istanbul. And that is why if you go to Istanbul, and inshallah, I'll be doing that next year as well. If you want to come with the academic tour, there's so much history to see. So much history to see. You can see Christian history. You can see uh, Roman history. You can see Muslim history. You can see so much in that city. It goes back so many years and the eras of uh, you know, human civilization overlap. So how do we understand that hadith? In another hadith, we learn that Constantinople will be conquered by 70,000 children of Ishaq. Ishaq, the children of Isaac, will help conquer Constantinople. How do we understand this? Allah knows best. But it appears this is talking about another conquest towards the end of times. It appears that a time will come where that land will no longer be considered a part of the lands of Islam. That's not the case right now. But something might happen that those lands are no longer considered the lands of Islam. And so once again, there will have to be a reconquest. And so this hadith that talks about 70,000 of the children of Ishaq, who are the children of Ishaq? The Arabs would call the Romans children of Ishaq. And this hadith predicts that there will be many Western people, because Rome is the Western land, who will convert to Islam and who will be on the side of the Mahdi and who will be fighting on the side of the truth. And they will then be reconquering Constantinople from whoever else it is. And at that point in time, they will use the dhikr of Allah as a weapon. And the dhikr of Allah, there will not be violence, there will not be bloodshed. They will simply say, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the dhikr will go louder and louder until as a miracle from Allah, the walls of the city will collapse and they will simply walk in and conquer the city without any bloodshed. This is something that didn't happen in 1453. So clearly, therefore, there will be a another conquering of uh, Constantinople towards the end of times and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Another uh, prediction and this could be a trend and it could be a specific incident Allah knows best but we are all aware of one of the most amazing predictions that we now see in front of us in our own lifetime and that is the prediction that in the Arabian Peninsula there shall be higher and higher buildings. In the Arabian Peninsula, there shall be skyscrapers. And this is something that, again, who could have ever imagined? We need to understand, when Islam came to Arabia, the Arabian people were of the most backward in the world. They did not even have government. They were tribal. You know, the basic sign of civilization is government. They didn't have a government. They didn't have a codified language. They did not have a script. The script was developed after Islam. They, there was not a single library in all of Arabia. There was no three-story structure. Didn't exist. The max you could do two stories, very small. They couldn't build tall buildings. That's why even when they had any type of technology, they're bringing it from outside because they're not any technological advance. They would import their swords from India. That's why the hadith mentions Indian swords. They would import their armor from Byzantine. They would import their cloth from Yemen. The Arabs did not have that level of civilization that, Arabs, uh, that other lands had. So for the Prophet predict to predict that Arabia and the Arab lands would have the tallest buildings is once again surreal. How could that happen? And not just that, but people who were only yesterday dirt poor would be competing with one another to who is going to build a taller building. And I don't need to go into explicit detail. Wallahi, this is self-evident as we speak. These oil-rich families that control that part of the world, their own rulers were born in poverty. Listen to the interviews of the senior princes, those that are still alive. They tell us, look at their YouTube videos. When their own fathers came to power, and back in the 20s and 30s, they weren't rich, there wasn't oil back then. These same princes mentioned they didn't have running water. They didn't have shoes and slippers. They would run around in the sand. And what did our Prophet ﷺ say? You will find barefoot 
shepherds. Their ancestors were shepherds. They were barefoot. And now that they are the multi-billionaires, what do they do? What is their pastime? What is their hobby? In the year 2000, Faisaliya Center opens up. In 2010, Burj Khalifa opens up. In 2015, this happens. Each one of these princes wants to show that I have the bigger building. And Burj Khalifa, by the way, is two and a half times taller than the Empire State Building. Go imagine that. And when the other prince of Arabia heard that, he goes, Khalas, I'm going to build in Riyadh something that is even taller than your Burj Khalifa. It's as if, mashallah, their iman is so strong, they want to prove the process and correct. And they're going to say, look, I'm going to do exactly what the Prophet said. But of course, they anyway. So the point being that it is self-evident in our times, we are seeing this phrase enacted in front of our eyes. Who could have ever imagined? Who could have ever imagined? Three or four, or I forgot now, five of the, they keep on changing, of the tallest 10 buildings in the world are in that region. Go figure. And who did them? Shepherds that were born barefoot, poor, and each one is competing with the other to see who is going to build the taller building. So these are all specific incidents that have been predicted by our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let us now move on to the next section of our predictions and that is general trends. It's not one off. It's a general trend that the Prophet ﷺ predicted things would change towards the end of times. And he's mentioning how societal changes will occur. What is going to change in culture? What is going to change in how people live, in how people interact? So we'll mention around 10 or 15 of the general trends predicted by our Prophet ﷺ. Of them, he explicitly predicted that our problem of this ummah would be an excess of wealth, a surplus of wealth, not a lack of wealth. Generally speaking, the ummah would have plenty of wealth. Hadith is in Sunan al-Tirmidhi. Every ummah is tested with one fitna. And the fitna that Allah will test my ummah with is money. The fitna that Allah will test my ummah with is money. Hadith in Sahih Bukhari. That one day money came from Bahrain and the Prophet was going to distribute it at Fajr time. So he prayed Fajr and he saw the masjid packed like it was Jumu'ah. And he said, it looks like you have heard that the money has arrived. They said, yes. He said, I give you glad tidings. Don't worry. You will get your money. But wallahi, I am not worried that you will be poor after I die. I am worried that this world will open its treasures to you. And you will compete with one another to see who has the most treasure. And in that competing, you will destroy yourselves like the nations before you destroyed themselves. So the Prophet ﷺ, when there was extreme poverty, when many Sahaba, did not even have two pieces of cloth. When in the Madani phase, he himself, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as Aisha says, never ate to his full twice. When six weeks would go by, and they didn't light a fire because they didn't have meat to cook. Six weeks would go by without a fire. In that phase, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam predicted, my ummah will be a rich ummah. And we have wealth. Even the lands that are deemed to be poor, their natural resources are of the most wealthy. Even for example, Afghanistan that has a low GDP, the natural resources in terms of minerals, in terms of what it has, the world is salivating over it because of what it has. So the Muslim ummah is blessed with wealth. Mismanagement and greed is what has destroyed it. But we are a wealthy nation overall. And alhamdulillah, by and large, in many countries, the Muslims are living good lives, including the ones here in the Western lands as well. So our Prophet predicted this. He also predicted that evils would spread. And this is many, many things. For example, he predicted that people will stop trusting one another. The loss of amana, trust. He said, when people stop trusting one another, Wait for judgment day, it's around the corner. When amana is lost, when people stop trusting one another. He also predicted the rise of corrupt and evil rulers. When people who are not worthy become leaders, he said, wait for judgment day. The worst become the leaders, wait for judgment day. He also predicted 
that there would be plenty of bloodshed and fighting. He predicted that the Ummah would fight at a time when no two Muslims had ever drawn swords against one another. Imagine that. Never in the seerah did two Muslims draw blood as a civil war in the time of the Prophet ﷺ. Never did the two Muslim camps, in one occasion they, they came close to a fist fight, but it never went beyond that, never went beyond that. And even that fist fight, if you read the seerah, the munafiqun were the ones that were instigating it and not even there. And the Prophet ﷺ predicted that the ummah would continually fight amongst itself until judgment day. Once the sword is unsheathed, he said, it will never be put back in and the ummah will constantly fight until judgment day. He also predicted that not only the ummah, but overall killing and bloodshed and wars would be increased. And he predicted that people would kill one another for no reason whatsoever. And this was unknown. You know, mass shootings that are common in this land. We grow up and we are accustomed to them. Every few days we wake up and some crazed lunatic has killed people for absolutely no reason. We are accustomed to it. We need to understand this phenomenon does not take place anywhere in the world other than this land. You all know this. Anywhere in the world, this really does not take place. Number one, number two, even this is a recent phenomenon. It is unknown in human history that people just go on a mass killing for no reason and kill people. And our Prophet ﷺ said, the judgment day will not come until the killer and the one killed will not know why each one did it to the other. Neither will the killer have a motive, nor the one killed will know why was I killed? What was the purpose of my killing? Senseless killing. And this was predicted by our Prophet ﷺ and hadith is in Bukhari. Of the predictions as well, and this is something that, again, we are born at a time and place, we never think twice about it. Our Prophet ﷺ predicted that intercourse outside of marriage would become the norm. Zina would become the norm. Now, again, we are born in a time and a place where it is the norm. So we kind of think that has been the case always. No. Even in Jahiliyyah, even in pre-Islam, families with dignity, with respect, did not engage in premarital, much less extramarital. And that is why in the famous hadith of Sahih Bukhari, it's also in, in, in uh, Sira ibn Hisham, when the conquest of Makkah took place, and grudgingly, Abu Sufyan and his wife accepted Islam. And what is the name of the wife of Abu Sufyan? Who can tell me? Hind. Hind. All of us Hindi should know what it is, right? By the way, why was Hind called Hind? Another tangent here. And this is going to help us Hindi people. Why was Hind called Hind? <laughs> Abu Sufyan's wife was from India, mashallah, mashallah. <laughs> No, no, no. All the Sayyids are from India. Just remember that, okay? All the Sayyids, we are from India, mashallah, tabarakallah. I predict, I, I say all of the descendants of the Prophet they migrated to India and Pakistan. That's why every second one of us, mashallah, we are Sayyids. Anyway, that's just a joke. Why was Hind called Hind? Mashallah, is good for us people from that part of the world. The Arabs exoticized India. And so something that was very beautiful was Hindi. So Hind was called Hind meaning it's a name that is meant to imply, her father would have named her this, Utba would have named her this, to imply she will be a beautiful lady from India, an Indian type of lady. So they're called Hind. Anyway, where was I? So when Hind embraced Islam, she wasn't too happy, but she did it. Then Allah opened her heart for, for Islam. So she came to uh, give the oath of allegiance to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a famous story. It's actually a very funny story if you listen to it, the many things happened there. So much so Umar bin Khattab fell down laughing so loud, he couldn't contain his laughter. It was a funny thing, I'm not gonna, we don't have time to that. One of the phrases, Hind objected to every condition somehow, yet she still took the oath of allegiance, right? So the conditions are going forth and Hind has something sarcastic to prod back. And one of the conditions was that once you embrace Islam, you will not do zina, you know, outside of marriage. You will not in have intercourse outside of marriage. This phrase, Hind was not sarcastic, she was shocked. She was not coming with a swift comeback. 
On the contrary, she was shocked. What type of condition is this? And she said, ya Rasulullah? Does any free lady of dignity commit zina that you have to put this condition on us? In other words, even though she is not a Muslim at the time, she's lived her life in pre-Islam, the concept of intercourse outside of marriage, she was like, what? Why would you put this condition on us? What, 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 is it even possible that a dignified lady will do this? Right? This was the perception they had pre-Islam. And again, I'd like to remind us in this land, you will be shocked to find out that all of these trends go back one generation. Back in the 30s and 40s, the people are still alive of this land. In their age, if somebody wanted to marry another you know, person, they would have to ask permission from the father of the lady to go out on a date. And the date would be chaperoned. And the goal would be not just flirting around. No, this is now of marriageable age. The man has a job. He's 25, 26 years old. The lady is 22, 23. The goal is, are we compatible? This is back in the 40s and 50s. It was impossible in that era. And that's why if a lady became pregnant one generation ago, it was a matter of shame for that, for that family. They would send the girl to some type of private boarding school. This is literally one generation ago. Things have changed completely from the 60s and second wave feminism and you know, the radical movements you know, from you know, the, 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 the free you know, sexual liberation movements and whatnot. All of this changed in the late 60s, early 70s. All of this before for this point in time, even this land and all of the Western world, they had remnants of haya, they had remnants of dignity and decency. One generation and everything has changed so much so that these days, if a young kid in high school is not dating, the council will have a conversation. What's wrong with you? Everything okay? Everything okay? Everything, why aren't you doing something, right? And statistics, wallahi, are depressing. Over 70. And I'm sorry to be blunt, but you know, you're going to hear this from me. Listen, hiding these statistics is not going to change reality. Perhaps some of you might be shocked. Oh my God, he's speaking like this in the masjid. Ya akhi, if I don't speak about it in the masjid, where else are you going to hear it? If you're not going to understand, I'm not, I'm not going to understand that our children are living in this land and they're facing these problems and we don't solve them here. Where else do you expect them to be solved? So I apologize for now. I'm still, you, you know, you don't know my habits that well, but I don't shy away from speaking that which is going to protect our community. Over 75% of teenagers in this land are engaging in intercourse. Teenagers, 75%, both genders. Stop deluding yourself that your children and your child is an angel. Stop deluding yourself. My child and your children are living in the same land. May Allah protect all of us. We need to be aware of this. I'm sorry to be so blunt. A colleague of mine did her PhD in a Canadian university in sociology. I know her. I read her summary of the PhD. I have it on, on my file. And the PhD was the drug and sexual habits of Muslims on college campuses. The most thorough survey done of our Muslim community. And I'm not going to give you the numbers because honestly, I thought I knew, but reading that, it was like a dagger to my heart. We have an endemic crisis. I'm not going to give you the numbers. Suffice to say, it is terrifying. Terrifying. She did an anonymous survey, the most thorough survey of college going Muslim boys and Muslim girls. Drug use, tobacco use, uh, alcohol um, uh, and zina and the surveys are there it's a public PhD you can even find it if you want to look at it it's there the findings are there this is the world we live in now my point is this could never have been predicted even a hundred years ago even a hundred years ago no one could have predicted this type of revolution because these families the same people that were living amongst they had haya as well I mean, if you watch Lil House on the Prairie, they're wearing hijab better than some of us wear hijab. That's the reality. They had strict laws. Men and women are not going to be together you know, in public. They're not going to go out on a date unless it is meant for marriage purposes. There's no such thing as casual dating. All of this has changed. And our Prophet predicted what? He predicted in Tisharu Zina. Zina would be everywhere. And he also predicted that nudity would be everywhere. Fahisha would be everywhere. That 
people would show their bodies in public. And again, I don't need to comment to you. I just want to mention once again, these are things we don't understand and know. But in this country, in our own generation, the issues of pornography have changed radically. In the 60s even, it was technically illegal to get pornography. In the 60s. And the famous you know, Hustler magazine guy went to the Supreme Court and overturned the ruling. And in one generation, from it being illegal to get a magazine, now pornography is ruining every household in this land. And we still are reeling from the damages because of the internet and whatnot. Who could have predicted this? Who could have predicted this? One generation ago, the government, our government, had a special body to monitor Hollywood. And any scene that was deemed to be immoral was cut off. This is Hollywood. And that is why you will not find nudity in black and white movies. Why? Because our own government had some haya. And they would monitor Hollywood movies. SubhanAllah, in the 30s and 40s, if it showed drug use or extramarital affairs, the movie would have to show that the people who did it suffered because they wanted to teach morality. They wanted to demonstrate that drug users don't end up happy. They wanted to demonstrate extramarital affairs, they have problems. This is in this land. That's why if you look at the 40s and 50s, Clark Gable, all of these famous people, you look at their movies, overall there's a positive image. Not that negative. Nowadays, A'udhu Billah, even Disney Channel, you have to say, Astaghfirullah, Tawbah, Tawbah, when you watch Disney Channel, right? When I grew up, Disney Channel was relatively innocent, back in the 80s and whatnot. Relatively innocent, okay? We grew up in a different era. Now, Disney Channel itself, every second joke is a sexual innuendo. Every second thing is about boyfriend, girlfriend, and then these days, boyfriend, boyfriend as well. Who could have predicted this in one generation? Our Nabi Wasallam predicted it. He predicted it in an era and a time place where no one could have imagined that nudity would be prevalent. And he said that this is going to be the norm. So much so, and the, the, the hadith is explicit, he's, and this hadith is authentic, that a time will come when copulation will occur in public like donkeys do. In public. And... Wallah, I think we are even less than one generation of Allah Musta'an. The way things are headed now, Allah protect us. And there will be a man who will see this happening and he will say to them, couldn't you get a room? Couldn't you go behind a, 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 a door or a wall? And that man, the Prophet said, will be deemed by them to be so righteous the way you look at Abu Bakr as-Siddiq. Look at this. And if you look at where this society is heading, I swear to you, it is terrifying. Anyone above the age of 35, you see how quickly, you teenagers, you youngsters, for you this seems to be the norm. We who have grown up in the 70s and 80s, we will tell you how quickly things have changed in our own lifetimes. From where to where. And what's going to happen in one generation? It's exponentially changing. It's not changing, you know, steadily. No, it's exponentially changing. And frankly, that also explains the rise of weird manifestations of uh, sexual habits as well, which we're seeing as well, because this is what happens when you open the door. Who predicted this? Our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He mentioned that towards the end of times, there will be a lot of women who, they are clothed and yet they are naked. Kasiyatun Adiyat. Hadith is in Bukhari. In other words, they're not dressed properly. And Ma'ilatun Mumilat. They will love to entice others. And others will love to be enticed by them. In other words, what this means, flirtation is open. And sexuality is open. Our elders here don't know what Tinder is. This is what Tinder is. This is exactly what it is. They want to do one way and the other one wants to do back to them. This is now open without even haya. Haya itself has gone. And this is explicitly predicted by the Prophet ﷺ, that of the last things to be gone from Mankind will be haya. When haya is gone, wait for judgment day. And we see this as well. Of the things predicted as well, is the proliferation of intoxications towards the end of times. And the prol proliferation of music as well. Now, music existed in the time of the Prophet I mean, It existed, but it wasn't common. It wasn't the norm. Uh, intoxicants existed, of course, but again, it wasn't the norm. And our Prophet ﷺ came and forbade intoxication and definitely discouraged the issue of musical instruments. And he predicted that a time will come when this will be the norm. It will be everywhere. And again, we see this now that 
the rise of you know marijuana and other things is now the norm common it is something that unfortunately even our own youngsters many of them don't think this to be a big deal as well experience the beauty of islam and bring happiness into your life with our app one islam tv you will have access to a wide variety of interesting documentaries inspiring lectures and so much more download one islam tv from the apple or google play store today